Jesus, Jesus. I want to welcome you, even on Facebook, and all those who are going to watch later on YouTube. This month, we celebrate our 20th anniversary. Voice to the Believer Ministries was chartered and launched February 21st, 2002, to glorify God, to strengthen His kingdom through discipleship in Jesus, by his word, as the Holy Ghost reveals it, that all, all, all you under the sound of my voice will come to know and love Jesus. Amen? So today, the message comes from the Father's heart. You see, Jesus established, launched his church by his precious blood, a deliberate act of his will, the will of the highest judge of the universe. He had a plan. He wanted sons and daughters. He wanted a bride for his son. That's why the psalmist prophetically and emphatically declared in Psalm 24, 9, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up your lift up you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. He is the king of glory. And so at this time in our lives, we have to be willing to lift up the gates of our hearts, lift up the doors of our hearts. We have to be willing to cause the ancient doors of our families' lives to lift up to the King of Glory because there's coming a day, beloved. I want you to know there's coming a day, and I see it. I see it even at the threshold. There's coming a day when the Lord of glory will appear, and when he appears, every knee will bow to him. Every mouth will confess that he is Lord because he is. So now is the time. The Bible says, now is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the time for us to lift up our hearts to him. And he, the almighty God, the creator of the entire universe, the judge of the whole earth, he declares in, in Matthew 16, 18, through the mouth of Jesus, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So no matter what we see around us right now, and especially death is busy, no matter what we see, no matter what we experience, one thing we are assured of, the mighty God never changes, ever. So he says, I will Build my church. I will build my church. That's Jesus. Upon this rock. What rock? The rock of the revelation that he is God. He is Lord. He is king. And I want to tell you, his church is his body. That word church is the ecclesia. The ecclesia in Greek. And it's simply a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, some assembly. It's the assembly of the people who are convened at public places, like in this sanctuary, just for a purpose of deliberating. In a Christian sense, and I'm, I'm reading from the original Greek, 
in a Christian sense, it's an assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. It's a company of Christians whose hope is for eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It's those who everywhere, in any city, village, all across the earth, constitute such a company and are united into one body. So we have the universal church, and that's the Catholic. Not the, I'm not talking about the Catholic religion. I'm talking the word Catholic means universal. It's the universal church across the whole earth, Christ's body. And then in little pockets everywhere, like here in this sanctuary, where we meet as a body to stand against the gates of hell. Amen? It's the whole body of Christians scattered throughout the earth. It's the assembly of the faithful, even those who are already dead and are received into heaven. So the church, the church is called, and listen, what I'm talking about today is important. The church is called to serve. The body of believers across the earth were called to serve. Matthew 28, 19, we see Jesus instructed before he left. He says, go therefore, teach all nations. It's not blacks or whites or Catholics or Protestants or it's all nations. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go teach all nations. So we, the church, have a job. And we have in this hour to be about our Father's business. Jesus is our example. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us, For this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And I want to pause there for a minute. If Christ suffered for us, and he's our example, why in the world do we think that somehow, because we're Christians, everything is going to be fine and dandy, there are going to be no problems? No. We have to, the Bible says, obtain the kingdom, sometimes by violence by things we suffer. He's our foundation. Jesus Christ is our foundation, along with the apostles and prophets who wrote the Bible. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. So if you pull that cornerstone out, nothing is left. What the apostles and the prophets gave us in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is all about the chief cornerstone. Jesus, the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi was a shadow of the things that were going to come from Matthew to Revelation and are going to be fulfilled as we see in Revelation. Those in the Bible is our foundation. It was all about Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2.20 tells us we are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we, the church, look to Jesus. We look to all that the apostles and the prophets wrote from Abel, from the prophet Abel, Adam's first child. From Well, I don't know if, it's, if Abel was the first, because Abel and Cain, they could have been twins. I don't know which one was first, but Abel was a prophet. 
until Paul, the last prophet, all the way through, as we look in the scriptures, we see what God wants us to see, his mysteries. It says in Luke 11:50, the blood of the prophet, which, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. So we see that all that was done before that's written in the word is for our benefit so that we can use it as examples, so we can use it as the knowledge that we need. Jesus, our example, says in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in a listen, there's coming a day soon when he will not be in the world anymore because the rapture will cause all of his people who has his light in them and the Holy Spirit to rise up to meet him in the air, the dead in Christ rising first, and then we who are alive rise up to meet him in the air. When that time comes, the light will be out of the world for seven years, except for those who are going to struggle to believe and keep the faith. But that's another story. I want to encourage you today, the church, the body of Christ, has got to get back on track. We seem to have been a, a, a train that was just, for some reason, in 2020, pushed off the track. But you see, COVID didn't push us off the track. We were off the track before. COVID just made it obvious. So God wants us again to worship him in a place that he sends you. Where did God send you to worship? Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 to 6 and 13 to 14 gives us the instruction and the knowledge that God wants. Hey, Willie. Hey, Lydia, it says in Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation, shall you seek, and there shall you come, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings, your vows, your free will offerings, where God put his name, where God sends you, where he choose to send you. He said in verse 13 of Deuteronomy 12, take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord shall choose. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you to do. So God has a place for each of us to serve, a place where we come together as a body. And he says in verse 21 of, well, I'm not going to go there. Just know the Bible is clear that we need to gather together in that place where God sends us. You know, COVID-19 is just an excuse for a lot of us not to go back to church. And it's good because we get to see where we truly are on God's timeline. It's not COVID that stopped us from going to church. Yes, for a while it interrupted. For a while, we could not go into the building. Yes, 
But now what? What is the excuse now? It's not COVID. It's what we've experienced before. Many of us hated where we were, but we kept there because we want to keep up an appearance of being holy, of being righteous. Instead of going to seek God's face, to see God, why am I feeling this way about this place? Where should I go? Should I stay here? How should I order my life, order my steps, God? God never allows trials without an end in mind. And so when COVID came, yes, this person in that country and that nation may have allowed it, may have caused it, but nothing happens before except it passes through God's hand. And so, for instance, Job, it was that he would shift, that Job would come from just knowing with his mind to truly seeing the Holy One with his heart's eyes, to truly be prepared to be with God. And so we, as his children, must begin to see him through eyes that are enlightened. We need to know him intimately. We need to be moved to obedience to him, not just know of him. And that's what Job said. I heard with the ears, but now my eyes see you in Job 42. Seeing him changes our outlook. And thus it changes our behaviors forever. We, as groups all over the nations, in sanctuaries containing his church, his body, we must gather together once a week in obedience to God and do life together as he says. Why? Because we need to stand as one body against the enemy. And then we need to work out our salvation, but also work out the mission that he gave us. Because you see, there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Jesus says the laborers are few. And so they, these in the valley of decision must be persuaded to come in before the last trump sounds. Be persuaded by an obedient church. We can't fool people spiritually, deep calls to deep, and see people know when we're faking it, when we're truly children of God, or we're just faking it. And there's been a lot of faking going on in the last few years, and God had had it up to here. So when COVID was planned, he's like, okay, okay, go ahead. Because now we all have to examine ourselves to see where we are. And if you're not examining yourself, you're in a bad place. You know, people look at us who are faking and they like, aren't they supposed to be like God? that you claim to serve? Why should I believe in a God that you're sharing when you're not true, when you're faking it, when you're acting like me? By COVID 2020, God gave us that chance to come clean to ourselves. He already knew. Where are you supposed to serve God by God's edict? Where are you supposed to gather as a body? Where? One thing with America, it seems like there's a church on every corner. Where are you supposed to serve God? Let's face up. Let's fess up. And let's show up. Let's worship him in the place that he names, the place that he sent you. 
And I want to give you a word about our children and church. Our children, I am telling you, one of the one of the ways that we know that we're off track, just look at our children that I'm talking about the church that a church is producing in this hour. Our children need to be taught that God made a day of rest, that this day, the Sabbath, is holy to God and is used in worshiping and prayerfully seeking Him. It is a day of coming together as a family, a day of rest before beginning the new week, just like God did. He rested from his work on the seventh day. And that's what we do as a family. Our children learn by what they see us do, what they hear us say. And sadly, how can they see the need for Sunday worship, the need to come to the sanctuary when us as adults, oh, I'm too tired today to go to church. The laundry needs doing. A good TV show is coming on and I want to watch. Oh, it's raining. It's snowing. I'm bored with church. I don't like the pastor. I don't like the music. How are we going to train our children? Listen, the devil knows whether he's got us or not. He wants our children If you allow four-year-old Doug to stay home because he doesn't want to go to church, and you let six-year-old Tammy stay and visit with friends who do not go to church, then how do you expect Doug and Tammy to want to go to church at 12 and 13, the reaping years, Just because you say they should go. How? Don't be deceived, Galatians 6, 7 tells us. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. So if you're sowing to your children, oh, you don't need to go to church. Oh, you can go visit friends on a Sunday and don't go to church. You're sowing what you're going to reap. And the enemy knows it. Listen, our kids are bored in church. Sad to say, too many churches before 2020 were putting on the best show to catch the fish. They forgot. They forgot that the one who commissioned us is the same one from 2,000 years ago. And the gospel says, unless he draws the fish to Jesus, the fish can have no part of him. John 6, 44, unless God draws, unless the Father draws us to Jesus, we can have no part of him. So no matter what fancy show we put on, we can go into the world for the fancy shows, for the Xbox and the pinball machines. Oh, I'm not saying don't have them. But when that's your draw to get the children to come, and it's not Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit, we've got a problem. Children are drawn to God by aids and visual arts chosen under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God and not by man's wisdom and man's logic. The purpose of the church is to minister to God through worship and then to have him minister back to his people through his revealed word, strengthening our faith in our fellowship with each other. It's a place for believers to gather where they love And encourage each other in the Lord. I had a young lady text me today. And she said something that's even now bringing tears to my eyes. She says, I'm so alone in this world. Her mom insulted her and told her 
things that were not appropriate. And she says, I am so alone in this world. That's why he places us in community. That's the reason we gather together, one of the reasons to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to be there for each other through our testimonies of his goodness and his faithfulness. It's a place where souls are drawn into the kingdom of God by the love and the joy and the awe of God that they see. It's certainly not a place to entertain you and your kids. No, it's not. Church is not a place of entertainment. And I'm saying, and I've said it before, and I'm saying it again, the days of the diva pastors and the diva singers and the divos, it's over. Those who are going to be doing it still, they're on their own. God's going to pass them by. This is not the day. And this is the hour when we need the Spirit to discern to us whether this is the place we should be or not. Because we need the Word of God in spirit and in truth. We need to worship God in spirit and in truth, not entertaining the people with our gifts. Gifts will not save anybody. Gifts will not get us to heaven. It's the gift, Jesus Christ. So everything that we do as a church should be around Jesus Christ. And our children need to know that. Johnny is bored with church because the adults have trained him to expect rewards for going to church and for being good. Oh, if you go to church today, I'll give you so-and-so. They need to understand that church attendance and church participation is as natural and an integral part of their week just as eating and sleeping. There is no question of whether they should go or not or whether they participate. No, they shouldn't be. The night before, they prepare for church. And the day of church, they get ready and they go. No questions. It's just as natural as breathing. Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. The day, Harma, is fast approaching. When the Father will look at the Son and point to the clock and say, time, go and get my children. When he'll tell the angels, to sound the last trump. It's fast approaching. And we are not ready as a church. And let me tell you this. There is going to be a spotless bride. The sad part of it, and this is a part that I always pray that doesn't come to pass, that the, there's just a narrow way, a narrow way to heaven. Few people are going down it. And there's a broad way to hell. And too many are going down it. And my prayer is, God, no. No. All the multitude that are in the valley of decision, your family, your friends, we want them on the narrow way. The day is fast approaching. And we need to do it God's way. Listen. Listen. The children may say, you're old-fashioned. We serve an old-fashioned God, one who never changes. His character will never change. So if somebody calls you old-fashioned because you think the church is important and they don't, it's a compliment. That's okay. Thank God. Jesus is returning for a glorious church. Ephesians 5.27, so we can be sure that no matter what's going on around us, that there are currently many churches 
who are willingly, many pastors who are willingly following, many minstrels, many psalmists, willingly following the Holy Spirit in preparation for this wonderful day. And I want to encourage you today, if you're not in a church, let the Holy Spirit guide you to one. It is imperative that prayerful consideration is given to where you and your children worship and that regular attendance is made with a joyful and thankful heart. And you must pay your tithes and offerings. The doors of the church cannot stay open for long without your tithes and your offerings paying the like bills. This building we had two Sundays that was so cold because the heat went out. And like the landlord said, it cost a mighty pretty um, penny to get the heat on. Somebody's got to pay it. That's why God says the tithe, the 10% is his. It is not ours. It's his. We give him the tenth. He blesses the 90. The tenth is to take care of the sanctuary, pay the pastor's salary. His wife deserves to eat. The children deserve to eat. And they even deserve a nice day, like my daughter says. They deserve a slurpee every now and then. The tithes need to be paid. And our children need to see us doing the right thing. So they can emulate us with a joyful and thankful heart they need to watch. I want to give you this advice for young children in church. Listen, church is not a time to kuchikuchiku and play with your baby, to entertain your young children. That is not the place. Teach them early to shift gears according to where they are. Practice for church behavior. Practice it by having quiet times at home. Yes, you have to practice it sometimes. One great way that we found that worked for us when our children were little is for each child and adult to sit quietly and read for a set time, a couple of days a week. Each sits in a separate place in the same area. And this will not only train them to exercise self-control, to be quiet and attentive in church, but it's going to help them in school. And that's a whole nother story with what's going on in our schools right now. It'll help them sit quietly in restaurants. I watch when we go to the restaurant and see children running up and down. That is not a place to run up and down. There are waiters and waitresses bringing hot food out. It's annoying that you can't control your child. And then you look at us and expect us to smile. Because your child is so cute. They're not cute. They're being annoying And you're training them to do the same thing in church and the same thing in school. Quiet time. A period of quiet time. It's also an awesome way to encourage and improve their reading skills, their creative and critical thinking skills, and it increases the bond in the family. A good time to exercise this quiet time is when the babies are napping and 10 to 15 minutes before the toddlers are put down because this gives the toddlers time to participate in the quiet time. Then off the nap while the older ones continue for another 30 or 40 minutes. Of course, you increase the time as they get used to the routine. Set ground rules before you begin. Everyone gets reading material. Older children can have pencils and a journal 
in which they can record questions they need to ask later and to make important notes for discussion. You can, you can choose a specific book or reading material that is geared to a particular topic maybe or a particular person that later you can sit down together and, ex and, and discuss. Very small children can thumb through picture books, especially created for them. The local library, the thrift stores, the dollar store, though it's the it's the dollar twenty five store right now, and and you can find some surprisingly beautifully created children's picture books at the dollar twenty five store. Ollie's Bargain Store has a wide selection of children's books beautifully created garage sales is a great place to find good books yesterday i went to the library and i picked up some picture books that i'm going to use with my I'm, I'm going to do this enrichment class on tuesdays with elementary kids and so i'm going to be reading to them i picked up some books from the library. I checked out three of them for 21 days and put others on hold. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. I was surprised to see this one, Good, Good Father, by Chris Tomlin and Pat Barrett. And of course, we sing a lot of Chris Tomlin songs. One of them is The Good, Good Father. We sing that um, in church all over the, the nation, and he's got a nice picture book for children that they can thumb through. And there's a book here, Ways to Be Kind, written by Lauren Gables, one of her musician friends, written for her children. And then I love this one, Are You My Mother? And there's so many books, I mean, books galore that you can find that the, the littlest kid who cannot read. This one, for instance, is such a hard cover that the little one-year-old thumbing through it will not destroy it. The little nine-month-old, the six-month-old can, can put this and chew it and wouldn't destroy it. There's so much out there. So much. So in your quiet time, Everyone goes to the restroom before the exercise begins. Everyone goes. And there should be absolutely no talking during this time unless, of course, it's an emergency. And you have to clearly explain to them what constitutes an emergency and how to get the attention of the, the adult, the parent, if it's necessary. Questions and comments are to be held and be asked at the end of the quiet time experience. Set an alarm. When everyone is ready, and off you go. All phones are put on silence and out of sight. There should be absolutely no texting or other form of communication because this is strictly a quiet reading time. You can place all phones in a basket during this time and they can get it back at the end of the exercise like every skill learned practice and patience is needed after the exercise is completed be sure to have a good lively fun discussion where all the non-nappers participate it's a good time to have popcorn a good treat Remember, the goal is to train them to be quiet for an hour or two. To be quiet. To, during this time, focus on gaining knowledge without the help, without having to ask anyone for help. It's a quiet time. When the child goes to church, inform them that this is one of those quiet times when their focus is on God. Have everyone, including the small ones, participate in worship. It's ridiculous that you have your child sitting there, bored, playing on their little whatever, during worship. 
We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And your child needs to learn that at a very, very early age. And to have them sitting there playing, talking, texting is ridiculous. It's an abomination. Have everyone, including the very small ones, participate in worship. Don't let them talk or sit around slouching and looking bored. No. It's important. Listen, it's important that they participate in worship and in listening, the older ones, to the discussion of the sermon. This is important to foster the engagement of their hearts with Christ. A lot of us are saying things like, I took my child to, to to church. We go to church all the time. I don't understand why they're so bad. Because their hearts were never engaged with Christ. You have to be deliberate when you have children. Once you have children, you're never the same anymore. You can't be the same. And too many are still trying to be the same. Their hearts have got to be engaged with Christ. And that takes training, even training by the way you are living and speaking. The things you are doing is training your children. They're watching you. That's when there's a song that says, be careful little eyes what you see. And the ones, be careful little feet where you go. An urgent part of the Christian experience Experience is worshiping the Father, to recognize He is God, and no matter what happens and what I feel like, He deserves to be worshipped. And when we come into the sanctuary, it grieves my heart that adults come late for worship. They come after worship. They come during worship. It's as they're saying, "Up yours, God." I know this is time for you, but we don't have the time for that. We got better things to do. What better thing to do than to get to church on time and join in collectively? There the Lord commands a blessing. Let me tell you, there are days in the past when I didn't feel like nothing. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel good. I had heavy loads. And what I would do is go sit in the sanctuary. And just sit there and soak up the worship. And just just sometimes I want to lean on my brother and sister. Because I'm receiving. When they open their mouth and worship, I'm looking and I'm receiving from them. It's an experience with the most high. The one who knows us best and knows what we need. And we're saying to him, we love you. We thank you. We worship you. You alone deserve our honor. And we come late or we don't come at all for worship? No excuse. Again, we teach our children to disrespect the sanctuary, disrespect God, disrespect the ministers. So get your children engaged even by your own behaviors. And especially remember, no, they shouldn't be texting or Googling or communicating. Let the younger children dance in the aisle praising Jesus. Let them praise the Lord in the aisle. After worship and the offering, escort the younger ones to their class. On Sundays, let the older ones Take an outline of the sermon and you all discuss it later around the lunch table or the dinner table. If there's no class for the younger children, like here in this sanctuary, we haven't gotten a place for the younger children yet. So before the message begins, you send them to use the restroom because they should not be walking up and down. And when they get back, have them begin their quiet time that you practice at home, following the same rules with one exception. At this time, 
You use a basket of goodies. Listen. Younger children need something to occupy them at this time. Do not let them do anything during worship except worship. And when it's prayer, they stand up for prayer. But after that, you get that basket that you prepare ahead of time. A personalized basket or a bucket of material that they may each use quietly without having to ask any questions or ask for help. Remember, they're practicing quiet time. Comments are for after, unless it's an emergency. And again, you have to tell them what constitutes an emergency. Place in each basket or bucket such things like coloring books and crayons that are not going to damage the furniture and the carpet of the church. Don't bring things like markers that will damage the furniture. Teach them to respect the furniture. Let them bring, you put reading material in the basket. Put quiet educational, quiet educational games, games that they can play by themselves quietly. Bring a small trash bag for them. Bring a snack like Cheerios that is easily cleaned up. It's not wet and messy. Separate each child on either side of the adults so they're not tempted to speak to each other. And at the end of the service, have them put away all their stuff back in their basket or bucket and use their little trash bag to clean up their mess. They must be taught to clean up. Older children may do their homework during weekday services and after worship. Make sure it's after worship. If they don't have homework, they must be encouraged to listen to the message. Everyone should participate in prayers and singing. They should never walk back and forth during prayer or prophetic, especially during prophetic words. Teach them that this is God's time, not theirs. It's God's time, not their time and other people's time. Teach them to honor and respect the sanctuary without making them feel they can't laugh and enjoy Jesus. Listen, God has no grandchildren. I want to repeat that. God has no grandkids. Children, each at an accountable age, have to come to him through Jesus just as an adult. And an accountable age may differ according to the understanding of that child. Some understand as young as two and three. Our girl gave her heart to Jesus at four and was filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues shortly after. You be watchful over their souls because at some point the Holy Spirit is going to lead them to the right moment when they'll let you know they're ready to give their hearts to the Lord. They may not say it in those words, but they'll begin to ask questions. And you have to be ready to lead them to the Lord or have somebody in mind who you know will help them. And don't ever dismiss this. Don't ever dismiss their interest because you're too busy or you are disinterested or you think they're too young to understand. Listen, your child cannot enter heaven without Jesus as Savior if they've passed the age of accountability, an age known only to God that the Holy Spirit will reveal to that child, to you. So watch, watch over their souls. Which brings me, when I talk about watch, watch not only over their souls and your souls, but together as a church body. 
Matthew 24, 42 tells us, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken upon. Therefore, you also be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. The Son of Man is coming. And we have to have our kids ready. Too many have passed that age of accountability. You know, it's said that when a child gets to 12 years old, when they pass 12, it's harder for them to bend and come to the Lord. So we need to get them early. It's not impossible but it's harder because they, they develop this independence, especially how you've trained them by not training them at all. They've got this independence. They want to, to watch what they want. They want to wear what they want. They want to do what they want. And this bullying, our children have become mean-spirited and evil, and we've got to watch for their souls. So it says, watch, because you don't know what hour the Lord is coming. Luke 21, 36 says, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. First Peter 4 tells us in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober. Watch unto prayer. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Listen, we have to show up. Show up where he sends us. We have to watch over our children and train them for him. We have to watch together as a church body. The next thing I want to tell you is we have to work while it's still day. Work while it is still day. We just have to work as a body. We're not just one person. The Bible says the body of Christ is many members. And we learn right here on this earth how to work together. Like I told somebody I think I mentioned it in church last Sunday. January, I was an awesome Christian. I want to commend myself on what an awesome Christian I was because I was by myself. Christianity would be perfect if there were no people. But it's in community that iron sharpens iron. It's in community that we learn how to walk together in unity it's in community. We have to show up as a body. The Bible says in Psalm 133, 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 tells us, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the other one will pick him up. But woe to him, and that's what that young lady told me today. Woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. That's what she said today. I feel so alone, so abandoned. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two will withstand him. And a three-fourth cord is not quickly broken. So I want to encourage you today, quit the COVID excuse. Time is running out. We're training our kids wrong because they're watching us and they're learning from us. Show up where God sends you. Watch together. Work together. We have to in this hour 
We have to in this hour. We have to labor together with God. First Corinthians tells us, chapter 3, verse 9, we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. We are God's building. So we need to work together in this hour. We need to get back into church. And so I'm coming to a conclusion now. We are one body. Many members, but one body. We have to get back into the sanctuary with a heart that says, Father, help me to understand the purpose of us gathering together and fulfill it. You show up for worship because you're worshiping the Lord. You listen to the message because if that pastor is serving the Lord, they have prayed and labored to hear what is it, God, that you want these people, your sheep, to hear. And that message that's coming forth is what God needs for you to hear that day. We have to get back in the sanctuary. We have to. We have to get back, I guess, first with God. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, they always ask that question. Well, of course the chicken comes first. <laughs> because he created the birds before he told them to be fruitful. So that doesn't apply. But I just, I just felt like saying that. I'm just saying, which comes first? Us getting back with God so we can know to get back to the sanctuary? Or get back to the sanctuary and get back to God? Maybe both. The important thing is know that he put us in companies. He did not put us alone. I've got a word of knowledge from Michelle. Michelle, God sees your labor of love. Yes, you've been crying a lot, Michelle, because you feel so unworthy. And God is saying, you are worthy because of me, Michelle, don't focus on you and what you've done, Michelle. God says, focus on me and what I have done. It's because of me that you are worthy. So don't let the enemy come to you with lies. Turn your focus to me and begin to see your worth through my eyes. And then... I heard Joy or Jordan. I don't know if they call you Joy for short, Jordan. God says you've been going through some difficult times. I don't know who is not these days. He says, but just like the book shows the end, that all things are made new. All things are made new. He says, Jordan, no matter what you've come through, I am going to work it together for your good. I'm going to work all things together from your good. And you need to begin to rest in me again. Rest in that assurance. Get back on that track where you're trusting me, where you're seeing me. And stop allowing the arrows of the enemy to come to you because you're not putting your shield of faith up. And you're not wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to counteract the enemy's attacks. Get back to the place I've sent you and ask the pastor and those there that you trust to pray with you and to hold you up because you are on the right track. You're just allowing the enemy to distract you with smoke screens. Tracy, wherever you are, God says, I have your number. I know your name. Your days are numbered by me. The enemy cannot take you out. The enemy cannot touch you without my permission. Just because 
somebody died soon doesn't mean that it's going to happen to you. Only thing happens to you, Tracy, is what I allow. Because I, as your father, knows what's best for you. So you have to get back to a place of trust. And one of the things the enemy has done for you, Tracy, is to keep you alone, isolated. Get back into community. Get back with the people who love me so they can help you and secure you. And then I hear Maru or Merku. You know your name. God says, I know your name too. He says, I've called you my name. You are my beloved. Maru, Merku. God says, I am pleased with you. You've been getting some flack from the self-righteous. You've been getting some flack from the religious. He said, like I did from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, but you focus on me and what I said. He said, you focus on my word and my spirit to empower you. And he said, you stay in community and you be empowered. Don't be afraid to be transparent to the place that I've sent you, Maru Merku. And so I want to encourage all you who are listening, who've listened this hour. God loves you. Time is running out. And he's saying, for all that I've done, don't let it be in vain. He said, any minute now, the trumpet is going to sound. Any minute now, you may be called home. You have to stand before me, he says. Everyone has to stand before God at the judgment seat. So he says, show up, show up, show up personally, show up collectively as a body, and don't forget to teach your children, and don't forget they learn by what you do and what you say, amen? Let's live, let's walk circumspectly, let's walk more deliberately in this hour. God bless you. I want to pray for those who are suffering from illnesses in their body. I take authority over every illness. You put your hand where you've got that illness, what is your breast or your head, wherever, your heart. I take authority right now over pain in the head, migraine headaches. And I command that spirit of infirmity to leave God's people now by his stripes. I plead the blood of Christ upon breast cancers. I command cancers to fall out now and go to the dry places in Jesus' name. Every type of cancer I command right now to go in Jesus' name to the dry places. And I call the spirit of the virtue of Jesus to overwhelm his people in the name of Jesus. I command debts to be paid. I command businesses to be righted in the name of Jesus. God, I just thank you today for touching the hearts of your people. I command hearts to be healed right now. I command sickness of the blood, diseases of the blood to go to dry places and the blood of Jesus flow through their body. I command every cell, every ligament, every tissue, every organ, every muscle, every blood vessel, every brain cell to begin to line up according to God's word. Line up right now in Jesus' name. Healing virtues of Jesus, overwhelm and overtake your people. Anointing of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, come and break yokes of bondages. Bring wisdom to your people. Pillar of wisdom. Seven pillar of wisdom. Come. Come with your spirit and overtake God's people so they'll know what to do. God, we give you glory. We give you thanks. Glorify your name all across the earth. And through every one of the sound of my voice, 
draw them to Jesus and strengthen them and heal them, heal marriages, heal children, bring prodigals home, bring those in the valley of decision to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you. Should he say the same? I will see you Sunday. God bless you.